Welcome to Whispering Word. Pray with me, please. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I ask that you'll speak to us today about our depression and deliver us from it, that we might rejoice in you and your goodness. Amen and amen. Well, hello there, it's Victor Robert Farrell here, and it's great to have you listening again to our midweek broadcast of 66 books from the very heart of Britain, where we're getting the raw word out to real people. Now, in today's Bible study, uh, speaking as a depressive myself, I want to share with you all a scriptural acknowledgement of the very state of depression amongst a multitude of the saints of the Bible, and outside of the Bible as well, for that matter. And with that, give you a couple of scriptural pills to take so as to be able to counteract what the World Health Organization estimates that in 2020 will be the second most diagnosed disease in the world, depression. Now in this message, I'm going to give you 15 scriptural ways to overcome depression. And I hope so very much. It's a help to so very many of us. But just before I do that, I want to tell you that we've now released our two daily devotional apps for the Apple iPhone and iPad, and you can get these from everydaybibleinsights.com. That's everydaybibleinsights.com. We hope they're a blessing to you as well. Okay, so for today then, I want to give you some insight in how to avoid and how to get out of the pit of depression. Okay, so let's get to it then. Thank you very much, crew, for leading us in adoring the Lord this morning and uh, helping us to remind ourselves about the goodness of God. And that's what we're going to do this morning, to remind ourselves about the goodness of God as we look at this interesting subject of how to avoid the abyss or how the how-to guide of getting out of all your dark Cold Dungeons of Depressive Hopelessness. Sounds a a happy title for a sermon, doesn't it? For a message this morning, but it's really quite important. You know, the title of this series of messages that we've been going through is Diving Deeper Into God, because we want to seek all of that sunken treasure, all of the lost treasure for ourselves there, still waiting to be found. We want to reclaim it for ourselves. We want to discover all that has not been used. And so far, we've looked at three things. May I remind you, we've looked at the importance of being in the boat where Jesus is. We've looked at how to walk on water. That's how to get out of the boat and walk towards Jesus. How to move our mountains into the middle of the seas was last week. And today, I want to talk about how to avoid that ledge beneath which is a thousand fathoms of all-embracing, icy, cold blackness. Yes, I want to talk to you about how to avoid the abyss of depression. Pray with me one more time, will you? Father of delights, for that is what you are, before your throne of grace, help us to sharpen our swords of truth this morning, to anoint our shields of faith, and to refit the helmet of our salvation. Let your holy word become for us the pleasure ground of our mind, the comfort of our soul, the healer of our body, and the quickening of our spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, friends, our foundational text for this morning is found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 26, and verse 3 and 4. Listen to these marvelous verses, shall we? Isaiah 26, verse 3 and 4. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Let me read that again. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah, the Lord is everlasting strength. Let me first say this morning that depression happens to what society calls the very best of people. Isaac Newton was a very depressed person. Michelangelo, Leo Tolstoy, Beethoven, Abraham Lincoln, Ernest Hemingway, Vincent van Gogh, Charles Dickens, And we visited Chartwell just a few days ago, 
and so you know who I'm going to say, was a terrible depressive with a black dog on his back. That self-medicating, cat-napping, bipolar genius Winston Churchill. Depression just doesn't happen to the best people in society, but it also happens to the best of the saints in Scripture as well and beyond. Let me remind you of Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, where in depressive moaning he tells God, you know, you promised me an heir and there's nobody. You know, what can I do? You made all these promises and I have no heir. What about Jonah at the repentance of Nineveh? Do you remember Jonah, the prophet that was sent to preach to Nineveh? And uh, you know that strange, wonderful story about how a great fish swallowed him and vomited him up on the shores there of Assyria. And he, he walked to Nineveh and in a very grumpy and restrictive way he proclaimed that God would judge the whole city unless they changed their tune. And they did, they changed their tune, they, re they repented. And he so hated the Ninevites that he sat on a hill and he said to God, oh, that's it, you've done it now. You were true to your word. You said if they repent, you'd forgive them and you have. So all I want to do now is die. Because you might love them, but I hate them. What about King David in his many depressions? Here's one example in Psalm 38 verse 8. I am feeble, says David. Listen, I am feeble and severely broken. I groan because of the turmoil of my heart. Lord, all my desire is before you and my sighing is not hidden from you. The Psalms are a mixture, aren't they? Of I don't know. It seems to me that the Psalms are for the bipolar man. When you're manic and you want to praise God, get into the Psalms. When you want to die, get into the Psalms. Uh, what about Jeremiah? I don't have to give you uh, one particular verse for the depressive nature of Jeremiah. I just want to say, read the whole book. <laughs> the whole prophecy of Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, is one of depression. What about the Apostle Paul? Oh, Robert, the Apostle Paul never got depressed. Read on, Macduff. Just read what he wrote there. What does he say in 2 Corinthians 7? Indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. We were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts. Inside were fears. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. Do you see that? He says, God, who comforts the downcast. And I, we were downcast, depressed. We were comforted by the coming of Titus. What about the great prophet Elijah, who, very similar to Jonah, was so exhausted in ministry, so disappointed at the lack of a move of God in terms of repentance and the revival of his nation, that he sat underneath what the Bible's called a broom tree and says, that's it, I'm done, kill me now. Finish me off now. What about one of our greatest hymn writers, William Cowper? William Cowper, quite frankly, was, was balmy. There's no question about it. He had a complete uh, breakdown. Uh, what a great poet. You know, this is uh, William Cowper that worked with the famous minister John Newton who wrote Amazing Grace. And together they compiled a hymnal, John Newton writing over 200 hymns and Cowper well over 60. Some of his famous ones, do you know? God moves in mysterious ways. He writes his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea. Rides upon the storm. You fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. He tried to kill himself many times during his life. He was institutionalized before he was uh, offered a post uh, to work as a, a lawyer in the House of Lords. And even though he was a, a great ministerial friend of John Newton, he had to be supported all of his life in his ministry with good friends. Even though he wrote majestic things, wonderful words, even though he wrote of a deep intimacy with his Savior. Yes, he did. There is a fountain filled with blood. 
drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. John William Cowper rather wrote that. And yet at the end of his life, he felt that God had deserted him. Depression is common. 20% of people in Britain are clinically depressed. Pastorally, I think it's much higher. The World Health Organization says that in 2020, it's 10 years away, in 10 years' time, in the whole world, the second most diagnosed disease will be depression. A depression will likely come upon you at some point in your life. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I'm speaking as a, as a pastor, not a medical professional. Uh, but I've noticed as a pastor that there's things like cultural depression. Uh, I've been around the world a little bit and I want to tell you that we Brits, we're a miserable bunch really. The BBC took a survey, do you know 25% of British people say that the future is hopeless. 33% of them says that frankly they're just downright miserable. 10% of them says they're better off dead. <laughs> When you say to someone who's from England, how are you feeling? They don't say, I, don't, I, don't, I feel great. They say, not too bad. <laughs> it could be worse. That's our nature, isn't it? There's this cultural depression. There's a Celtic depression. I'm a Celt. I tell you, I'm either homicidal or suicidal. It's one or the other. You rarely find me uh, in between those two in a balanced state of mind. I'm a miserable Celt. Some people are temperamentally prone to melancholia, aren't they? They're not happy unless they're a little bit miserable. Then there is a situational depression, isn't there? Stuff happens. We lose our job. Our marriage breaks up. Uh, the diagnosis is not what we'd hoped for. Uh, we lose our teeth. We begin shaving our father in the mirror in the morning, and that surprises us. Stuff happens. Situations happen. <coughs> Kids leave home, the empty nest syndrome. All this kind of stuff, the situations we find ourselves in can make us feel depressed. And then, of course, there's clinical depression. Uh, that can be linked to all of the things I've former mentioned, but it's due to a chemical hormonal imbalance, and we just go bonkers. I want to give you some practical steps about how to avoid the abyss of depression. But first of all, now I've stated that it exists, let me tell you what I believe is depression. Listen to this. I think depression is the absence of peace. Where there is no peace, the occupying armies are usually the heavy horse of dark depression, all weighed down with foreboding armor, concealed faces, dark flags. Depression, to me, is the absence of peace. And we need to have peace to combat depression. And the fact is that we need a double portion of peace. You know what? That text that we had, uh, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Do you know that uh, the Hebrew is this? Listen, you will keep him in perfect peace. That little two words there, perfect peace. It's shalom, shalom, or peace, peace. The Hebrew says, you will keep him in peace, peace. That's the way the Hebrew actually describes a superlative. Peace, peace. And that's not a coffee, by the way. Peace, peace. We need a double portion of peace. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind, that's whose thoughts, whose fantasies, whose mental constructions, whose framework of mental construction, has stayed upon you, lent upon you, hands together, leaning upon God. You will keep him in peace, peace, whose mind is stayed on you. And it literally means that, leaning on, putting both hands. It's linked to that practice of the laying on of hands. Like when the uh, Levitical priesthood were to offer a sacrifice, the high priest and the, and the Levites would literally lean on the animal, lay their hands on the sacrifice, lean on him. You'll keep him in peace, peace, whose mind is stayed, that's lent on you. 
And when we think about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and his words come to us and say this, cast all your care on me because I care for you. Look how much I cared for you. I died for you. If you want peace, peace, lay your hands on my sacrifice for you. Because he trusts in you. Now, we know from our Wednesday morning Bible studies that the trinity of faith, trust and belief, those three words, faith, trust and belief, they're almost as hard to explain as the oneness of God presented in the trinity. Faith is an act of the will. It's a volition based on the revelation of God's word. God's word comes and it convicts you and it challenges you and by your faith you embrace it. You choose to believe that. Trust is believing in spite of the evidence of our circumstances. Let me try and unpack that for you to explain what I mean. Now imagine, I just meet, we and Bridget have been married 30 years. And uh, I I met Bridget. This wasn't the scenario by the way, so this is a story, it's not true, an example. I met Bridget and I I check her out. And I find out if she's going to be suitable for me as a bride. So I think, okay, let's have a quick look here. She can cook. She looks good. She's probably going to age quite nicely. Amen and hallelujah. She's very pleasing to the eyes. People like her. Yeah. Yeah, she's she's okay. So with faith in my findings, I eventually say, will you marry me? She being partially sighted says yes. (laughs) I believe then that all will be well. Do you see this? So I have faith, I've I've investigated, I've got faith that my investigations are true. And then I marry her believing that all will be well. After 30 years, there's a knock on the door and the police arrive. And I say, hello. (laughs) And they say, we're here to tell you about your wife. I say, what are you talking about? I'm afraid, Mr. Farrell, she's a major drug dealer. She's employed by the mafia. And I say, hey, you've got to be kidding me. And they say, sit down a minute. And all of a sudden, they've got these funky photographs of Bridget with suitcases full of money, furtively exchanging it for bags of cocaine. They've got a a video, and I can hear her saying, a million's not enough. I want two million. (laughs) Otherwise, you're all dead. And they say, you see... Reverend Farrell, I'm afraid your wife is a terrible drug dealer working with the mafia. And I say to them, come on, I can see all what you're showing me. But I've been married to her for 30 years. I'm not sure everything's what it's cracked up to be here. I'm going to trust that what you're showing me is not indeed the case. See, trust is believing in spite of what appears to be the case. It's a resistance to the tyranny of the immediate. I like that. Trust is a resistance to the tyranny of the immediate. Let me say that again. Trust is a resistance to the tyranny of the immediate. It's believing in spite of what appears to be the case. So trust is the object of your mind stayed, thought laid hands which holds on to the goodness and the strength of God. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord. Despite your immediate circumstances which seem to dictate against the goodness and the greatness of God, trust in the Lord. For in the Lord is everlasting strength. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Jehovah the Lord is everlasting strength. Forever means trust in the Lord from vanishing point to vanishing point. Who can remember the old cathode ray television tubes? Do you remember? Who can remember whoever had a black and white one? Am I the oldest one in here? Thank you very much. I see a hand over there, madam. I see a hand there. (laughs) Do you remember when you used to turn them off at night time? All of a sudden the picture would collapse, (laughs) wouldn't it, into into a little point. 
And that point would get smaller and smaller. And I remember as a, a little boy watching this little point, even though there was no power, vanish eventually before my eyes. From vanishing point to vanishing point. As far back as you can see, as far forward as you can see, trust in the Lord forever from vanishing point to vanishing point. For in the Lord, in Yah, in Jehovah, that's just the shortened name of God, okay? Is everlasting strength. Strength. You know what that means? It's actually the Hebrew word for rock. Trust in the Lord forever, for he is the unbreakable, all sufficient, ever holding up rock. He's someone that you can firmly plant your feet upon. Okay, you say, that sounds good, Robert. Thank you for that exposition of that verse. Now, how do I do that, though? How, in practical terms, can I get this peace piece by trusting in the Lord from vanishing point to vanishing point and finding him to be my rock that I can stand on? That's fine you telling me that. That's a a good exposition of the verse. But how do I do that? Well, I'm going to tell you. Only because you've asked, mind you. Here's the first thing, how to avoid the abyss. Let's put the first one up then. Be depressed. There you go. You didn't expect that, did you? Be depressed. There are some things worth getting depressed about. So when people come to me and they say, I feel sad about this, I feel depressed about the other, I say, blooming heck, I'd feel exactly the same. Well, what should I do? And I say, be depressed. Be sad. You've got something to be sad about. You've lost your job. You've lost your husband. Something terrible's happened to you. It's good to be depressed. And I explain to them, vomit. Get it out. Be sad. Weep. Get angry. Kick a tree. Go and sit on your heavenly father's knee and beat his chest. Be depressed. Vomit it out. But then I say this. Be depressed, vomit, don't wallow. We need to move through the valley into the sunshine. We've got to not wallow though. Don't get stuck in your depression. And you will often hear me, and some of you think that this is not a pastoral thing, And I tell you it is a pastoral thing because I will get alongside some of you and say, look, stop whining. It's time to stop the moaning. It's time to move on. So the first thing to do then is be depressed, mourn and grieve. Secondly, keep close to God. Have your mind fixed on him. You know, read the Bible every day. We're doing this with our interns. We're trying to get some really good practice into their lives. We're doing it with folks on the mentoring program. We're trying to instill a habit of closeness to God. Read your Bible every day. Pray every day. Invite God into what you think are the mundane parts of your life. When I was in computer repair, in IT... Do you know something? When I couldn't find an answer to my problems, you know what I did first of all? I asked God. I said, Lord, where's the blooming manual for this? Lord, who do I need to speak to to find an answer? What do you think about this? I asked God. Involve him in your life. Keep close to God. If you're working in a restaurant, say, help me with more customers. Bring them in. Get God involved in your life, because he is anyway, just become consciously aware of that. Keep close to God, have your mind fixed on him. Thirdly, eat well, and preferably get somebody else to cook for you. Hallelujah, amen. This is what happened with Elijah. Do you remember Elijah when he said, I want to die? Do you know what God did for him? He sent an angel to cook him some food. And we say, oh, it was special food, it was angel food. Any time someone cooks for me, that special food. I'm a special needs person that gets special food. Eat well. Some of the crud that you're eating is going to make you depressed. If you're filling yourself up so that your blood sugar hits the roof and you feel fantastic for 10 minutes and then suicidal for an hour and a half before you have another toffee crisp, you're not eating well, are you? 
Know your body and eat well. One of the greatest ministries my wife has to me when I get down in the dumps is that she rarely encourages me verbally because I can't be. But what she does do is go and cook me something that she knows will minister to my heart. And it's amazing how food can minister to me and lift me up. Eat well. Go out for a meal. Get a curry in. Eat stuff that makes you happy. I'm not talking about lounging on the couch with a bottle of ouzo and 15 Mars bars. That's not eating well. But eat well. Here's another one here, number five. We've missed number three, haven't I? Sleep well. We need to sleep well, that's for sure. This is what uh, God did with Elijah. Fed him and let him sleep. And when he woke up, fed him some more, let him sleep some more. Sleep is absolutely vital. If you don't accept, if you're an intern, you've got to be up at 6.15 in the morning praying. That means you get to bed early. Sleep's vital though. Know what your body needs. Me, I'm a six, seven hour a day man. If I don't get that, I'll be crabby, grumpy, depressed eventually. And guess what? I'll make you crabby, grumpy and depressed as well. You need to learn to eat well, sleep well. Here's another one. Let's make sure that we live well. What does it mean by living well? A lot of depression is due to sin. We've sinned. And our conscience is troubled. And for us to not have depression, we need to live well. Don't sin. There is always consequences to your sin. Always. And some of that works itself out with depression. And the answer to that is to confess your sin and to receive the forgiveness of God. But if you lived well to start off with, you wouldn't have that blooming problem, would you? So if you don't want to be depressed, don't sin. Don't nick the money. Don't punch him in the nose. Don't have that affair. Don't, you see what I mean? Don't is a great pill for depression. Live well. Make sure you live from your heart and soul. Some of you I know are on this journey and it's a little bit frightening for you. And I'm beginning to feel it in some of you that you know that you might be in the wrong jobs. Yeah. Your heart's not there. You want to do something else. You want to live well. You want to live out of your heart rather than out of your mortgage requirements. That's scary. But if you live well out of your heart you'll be less likely to depression. Here's another one. Listen to good music. And I'm talking country. Amen. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Admittedly, there are some country music songs that will make you want to cut your wrist. We all know that. But find the music that, you know, excites your heart, that makes you want to live. But you can imagine that you're driving down a big wide road with a, in a big truck with the windows down and the sun beating down there and you're just singing along about dogs and trucks and family and friend and lost this, that and the other. And you just think, ah, oh, this is living. Uh, good music. What warms your soul? The Bible is full of good music. Uh, make sure that uh, you use it as a tool so not to be depressed. Here's something else you can do. Count your blessings. Count your blessings. Oftentimes, we, we get into the process, don't we, of counting everything. Oh, flipping neck. Monday tomorrow. <laughs> and then I've got five more days. Six, and I've got to be back here again. I'm not enjoying it now. <sighs> And what you need to do is say, isn't it great? Isn't it great that I'm here and I'm getting some stuff to help me not to get depressed? Isn't it great that it's 20 past 11 and only another 45 minutes before he's finished? Isn't it great? Count your blessings. Isn't it great that the sun's out? Isn't it great that the leaves are still on the trees? Isn't it great that you've got some chocolate in the fridge? Isn't it great that you've got a roof over your head? A bottle of wine in the wine rack? Isn't it great that even though you've got a cold, you've got some ibuprofen back in the cupboard back home? Isn't it great? Count your blessings. Begin to count your blessings. This will help you not to get depressed. Here's something else. 
uh, on the back of that that you need to do? Be thankful. Cultivate a heart of thankfulness. So when someone gives you something, like, uh, where's my wonderful scarf? Someone gave me that. I didn't say, everyone's going to think I'm Rupert Bear. (laughs) Or Scottish. Yeah, what's worse? Who said that? Oh, steady. (laughs) Oh. Or you can say, you know, I'm really thankful for this. It's going to keep me nice and warm. Oh, it's wool. Oh, I'm thankful that I've got some wool there. Be thankful. Count your blessings and be thankful. Say it out loud. Don't do it on a bus, okay, because people will look at you really freaky. Let's have a look at something else we can do that next one. Laugh much. and Don't take yourself too seriously. Laugh a lot. Proverbs says that there is so much medicine in laughter. We know that in laughter and in good exercise, endorphins get released and we feel good. It can be quite addictive. Even the National Health Service knows that people feel better and recover quicker if they're, if they're happy and they're laughing. So laugh much. Find something that gives you a giggle. Watch that movie. Sit down with some friends. Have a laugh. Laugh much. Take every opportunity to righteously enjoy yourself. We Christians need to be... Rena- oh, those Christians. They bar me. They love one another. They can't stop laughing. I'm not talking in a freaky kind of a way. I'm talking about in a normal, culturally sociable, understandable kind of way. They're just enjoying life. They embrace life to the full and they laugh much. What's it saying in Philippians 4? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. There's a single portion of peace, the peace of God. What does it begin with? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. And you say, oh, that means having deep joy. No, it doesn't. I'm sick of Christians with deep joy. It's so deep, it never shines out of them. I want some surface joy. I want joy that's on the surface and just flowing out of them. I want to be around people like that. Happy people, yes. Because they're rejoicing in God. Now all you truly British people are feeling truly condemned now. Saying, I'm not like that. How can we get there? Well, think well. Let's put that next one up there. Think well. Again, here's the Philippian pill for you. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure... Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, think on these things. And the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Think well. How about the next one that we need to do to avoid the abyss? Get with friends. I like what the Bible says. It says that a, uh, uh, you know, two-fold cord is good and a three-fold cord is not easily broken. It means get more friends. Widen your tent pegs. Enter into deep relationships, not with one person, not with two, not with three, but with good friends. Get friends around you. It's very important. Finally, this morning... May I say to you, if you are in the abyss, you need to lay hold of his promises. This is great to keep out of the abyss, Robert. But what if you're in it? You've fallen into it. Well, the first thing you must do is lay hold of his promises. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He says, if you confess your your sin... He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He says that he is the great provider and he'll take care of you. He says that his goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. 
He says that he will be to you a husband. He says he will be to you a good companion. He says to you that he will be a father to you when you have none. He says that he will feed you even when people uh, do not provide for you. He says that he will provide for you a roof even when folks throw you out. You need to lay hold of the promises of God. Keep close to God. But the most important thing you need to do when you are in this depressed abyss is make the most of sunshine fair. Let me explain to you what I mean. Make the most of sunshine fair. Uh, John Bunyan, one of our greatest writers, one of our greatest pastors as well, uh, wrote in the uh, story Pilgrim's Progress about the time when Christian and Hopeful got off the path and found themselves in the grounds of giant despair. In Doubting Castle. And how giant despair came to them in the dark dungeon again and again and said, kill yourselves. There's no hope. Even provided the means of making an end to themselves. Even taking them out into the courtyard and showing them the bones, all these skeletons, and saying to them, these were pilgrims just as you are, and this is what I did to them, and this is what I'm going to do to you in just a few days' time. And that great pastoral writer Bunyan tells us how they found the key of promise, the promises of God, and they were able with some difficulty to unlock the key to the dungeon. And as they began to escape from giant despair in Doubting Castle, he pursued them. He just about was going to get them. And then, this is interesting, listen, Bunyan says the clouds broke and the sunshine came through. And when the sunshine hit giant despair, it put him into a mad rage and he didn't know what to do because the sunshine defeated him. Make the most of sunshine fair. You see, there will be times in your depression. Maybe it's five minutes during the day. Maybe it's one hour during the week. Maybe it's one day during the month. But there will be times... When out of nowhere the clouds break and the sunshine comes through, make the most of that sunshine fair. Get up and get a bath. Get up and get a meal. Get up and ring a friend. Get up and fulfill an appointment. Get up and begin to laugh a little bit. Make the most of that crack in the skies because the most that you make of it, the wider it will get. Do you see that? Let's move on to the next one here. We're almost done. Get with counsellors. It's a shame in us as churches that we don't have, oftentimes, the right kind of friendships to help us. You know, we're trying to cultivate these soul relationships where we can just get with our friends and with our mates and unload and let loose and share. And we're trying to cultivate a body of people who will be people of maturity and spiritual formation. Counselors within the church. And while we're journeying towards that, let's make use of the fact that we've got trained people within the body. We do have external bodies of professional people that we can recommend folks to, to go and help sort out those root problems and get them out there. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not weakness, it's wisdom. And the more counsellors you can get, the better. In the multitude of counsellors, there's great safety and wisdom. So sometimes you need counselling. Lastly, as we move on to 14, take the medication. Winston Churchill found it fascinating to read that he struggled with this depression all of his life. And it was probably a, a bipolar issue. It's certainly a chemically related issue. And many people think he self medicated all of his life with whiskey sodas. Sometimes 11 at a time during a meal. That's some medication. President Truman said that uh, sometimes he disliked meeting with Winston Churchill because he was drunk half the time. Uh, He self-medicated to get through these dark things. Even his final speech in Parliament, his doctor actually slipped him some crystal methamphetamine sulfate, or as you know, it's speed to actually lift him and get him through that final uh, delivery. 
Sometimes you need medication. What happens with this body of ours is that once we get into a funk and we start feeling depressed, our body stops releasing those hormones and all those necessary bits and pieces to keep us balanced. And we become unbalanced. And sometimes we need an injection. Sometimes we need a hormonal kick up the pants. Sometimes we need something to put us back in balance again. So we can get on an even keel and move ahead. Sometimes there's a need for prescribed medical intervention. Yes, there's a need to go to the doctor and say, I can't hack this anymore. I need help. Sometimes we need to take the medication. Is there a number 15? Can you believe it? There may well be. We need to trust in the Lord at all times. This is ever so important. Can I just take time, dear friends, to run through this again? Because it's ever so important. If you want to avoid the abyss, look at this. When you've got stuff to be depressed about, be depressed. But vomit and don't wallow. Keep close to God. Make him part of your life. Sleep well. Eat well. Live well. Sin not. When you do, confess it. Live out of your heart and soul. Listen to country music. Hallelujah especially. Good music. Count your blessings. Be thankful for them. Laugh much. Think well. Get with friends that you have a heart relationship with. When you're in a funk, make the most of sunshine fair. Get with counsellors to root out the causes. Take medication. But above all, trust in the Lord. Even when everything appears to be falling apart, trust in His goodness. Here's William Cowper. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust Him for His grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Jehovah Sabi. Well, what about you then, dear Christian? Are you in Doubting Castle, longing for death? Tempting to depart before your time? Well, you've got to stop that kind of thinking. Enough of those devilish thoughts. Sunshine is coming. What you're going through, I can say this to you for sure, this too shall pass. Sunshine is coming. And when it does, you need to make the most of it and get up, get out, and get on with God. And in saying that, I pray that God will provide you with as many friends, as many angels, as much food, comfort and rest that you need to become more than a conqueror through Christ who loved you and gave himself for you. We pray for you here at 66 Books right now that God would lift you from the pit, put you on your feet and that you would never again, ever again, fall into such deep depression. Would you pray for us as well? And pray for me in particular a fellow sufferer along this road. Amen and amen. Yes, mark well, O saints of God.